few announcements before we start. Uh, tomorrow is the uh, start of the Great Backyard Bird Count. It's a citizen science project you can uh, find online. You can uh, upload your sightings of birds, and it's a yearly event. And this year it's gone global, and it's dovetailed into eBird. So if you use eBird, that'll work for you too. Um, this morning we had our wildlife walk at Audview Park, and some of the people here attended it. It was very nice. <laughs> uh, our next one will be on March 9th. Um, you can get information about all our upcoming events and schedules from our website, otterpeakaudubon.org. Um, and that we have information on how you can join us over here to the left and what our organization does. Uh, another thing uh, I'd like to mention is uh, Jim Andrews is uh, having class uh, for beginning birders and intermediate birders at Hawkeye Community College. We've got a little information about that here, and he's right here, so you can ask him about it tonight, too. Um, and uh, the Marquee Theater downtown is showing a movie documentary called Chasing Ice, which is about global warming. And I think uh, it's a really important thing for people to see and learn about. So I highly recommend it. So. Um, our speaker for tonight is Mike Winslow, a former uh, board member for Outer Creek Audubon Society whose job, uh, one of his uh, yearly jobs was organizing this event, these uh, cabin fever lectures. And uh, I hope we'll be able to muddle on without him next year. <laughs> He's a staff scientist for the Lake Champlain Committee, author of uh, Lake Champlain and Natural History, a recipient of Audubon Vermont's Stephen Young Environmental Award, and uh, more to the point for tonight, he's the compiler and organizer for the Ferris Bird Christmas Bird Count and a participant in the Middlebury Christmas Bird Count where he's done a lot of owling. So, turn it over to Mike Winslow, Owls of Vermont. Thank you, Ron. So how do I get Ron? How do I get out of this? Okay. <laughs> well, I'd like to echo Ron in thanking you all for coming out tonight. Uh, it shows in part that the tremendous appeal that owls have for people that they're all folks want to come out and hear about about this tr un unusual birds. And so when I had the opportunity back in about 1998, Jim Andrews called me. I'd been participating in the Christmas bird count in Middlebury for a year or two at that time, was still cutting my teeth in the area. And he said, Mike, we lost our owls, owlers for the year. Would you be interested in doing it? And I was like, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> and they're owls. Yeah, I want to hear them. But you know, what do I have to do? Well, you've got to get up at midnight and <laughs> play a tape and listen for the birds. And, that's what I did that year, and I've been doing it ever since then for both the Middlebury count and also the Ferrisburg count. And off and on, I've done it for the Hinesburg count and um, I missed one. Middlebury, Ferrisburg, Hinesburg, and Mount Abe count as well. I've also did a little bit of owling for the breeding bird survey a couple years ago. But really, that's it. That's the extent of my uh, experience with this. I once described Randy Duran, my predecessor, uh, uh, owling in the Middlebury count is a really good owler. And the person I s was with said, what's that mean? Did, do you get up at midnight, you play a tape, you listen to owls. It's just actually trying to do it. So start with the question, of the observation, what is an owl? What makes these birds uh, owls? And a couple of things, uh, they, they're highly adapted to be nocturnal predators. Large eyes, excellent hearing, and a, a bunch of other features that, direct, that uh, compensate and, and augment those abilities, including this facial disc of feathers, which funnels sound towards their ears and, and augments their ability to hear, and also these rictal bristles around the nares that make them owls in, in particular. You would think, and, and I would think without doing any research, uh, that an owl, because it's a predator, because it, sh it shares so, so much of a niche overlap with hawks that it would be closely related to these other raptors. In fact, most of our, na our owls have a counterpart that hunts in the same habitats during the daytime. Wherever you see a great horned owl, you might find a red-tailed hawk during the day. 
Wherever you see a northern harrier, it's the a somewhat appropriate habit for a short-eared owl. Barred owls have been said to be uh, uh, similar to red-shouldered hawks, but I think of them more as like broad-wing hawks. But so because they're both predators, they've got this bulky bill, it would seem like they're similar. But most research suggests that the owls are actually evolved from the night jars and goat suckers, um, the, the, the whippoorwills and night hawks instead. So instead of a raptor that has started to hunt at night, they came from nocturnal predators that just started taking bigger and bigger prey. Uh, and, and so you see, even see intermediates, well, not intermediates, but so like a screech owl, a smaller owl is going to take insects like a whippoorwill or um, goat sucker would. In Vermont, we have uh, seven, seven species of breeding owls, and they can be divided and identified by basically two characteristics, their size and the presence or absence of ear tufts. So we've got small, medium, and large owls in the area. And on the small range, we have eastern screech owls, which have ear tufts, and saw-wet owls that don't. In the medium range, long-eared owls have ear tufts. And then this is the only group with two of them, both quite rare in the area. Short-eareds and barn owls are both medium-sized owls without ear tufts. And I'm going to go into pictures of each of these species afterwards. And then on the big range, we have our great horned owls with ear tufts and our barred owls without. In the Champlain Valley, where I d have done most of my birding, the great horns might be the most uh, common owls. They're, they're somewhat easier to see, in part because they uh, tend to be more out at dusk than some of the others. They're less nocturnal than some of the other owls. It's the, our largest owl. They'll prey on any other owl out there. Um, ex the only owl that they won't eat is a snowy or a great gray, because they're bigger than the great horns. But any of our local ones around here, great horns will eat them. They take rabbits, they'll eat skunks. Um, they're one of the few predators of skunks, in part because they can't smell. They, they, they depend on their hearing and sight, but they have no, no strong sense of smell. The only bird with a, any sort of sense of smell is a vulture for finding carrion. So great horns, uh, you'll hear out at night. Is that loud enough? <laughs> so the, <laughs> there's too many people to throw me. <laughs> the, the, there's both uh, the males and the females have separate calls. I think this is the male call. Who's awake? Me too. And then the female will answer in a slightly different tone. That's a, so that was a female followed by a male. Male. But who's awake? Me too. That's how you can remember which one is the great horned owl. Those are their common call, calls. That's what you'll hear during the winter when they're establishing their uh, territories, when they're seeking out mates. But you also sometimes hear, uh, I've only on one occasion heard um, the, young, the call of the young as they're communicating with the parents. Just a, a harsh little screech. It can actually carry quite far, though. I, uh, I had the privilege when I was living in Weybridge, there was a great horned owl nest in the woodlot right behind us. I managed to find it in February, or early February, right about this time of year. The owls will have laid it, will be laying eggs now. They're sitting on the nest. They've established their pair bonds, established their territories. They'll incubate for uh, eight to ten, uh, oh, I forget the details, sorry, six or eight weeks, I think. That sounds too long. They'll incubate for a period of time. <laughs> <laughs> the young hatch, uh, and I was able to, because I, the, the, the nest was right on the edge of the field, I would go back every week with a scope, just dips far enough away so I wasn't disturbing them, and just check on the progress of the nest. And you see first one owl head pop up, and then a second and a third. They ended up fledging three young. And at, around May, when I did the um, birdathon that year, the young were just off the nest in the trees around us, a little downy colored, uh, downy, still in their down, but off the nest, flying around, waiting for mom and dad to bring them some food. 
Uh, it is typical among owls that both the male and the female will feed the young and tend the nest. Uh, it's not true in all bird species by any means. Um, anything else about great horns? Owls, the, I, most of the owls that I've ex had experience with in my life, I've heard. They've responded to callbacks of, of tapes. Rarely have I seen them. When you do see them during the day, one of the most successful ways I've had of finding them is following crows, chickadees, or other birds that will mob the owls and try to drive them off their territories. And uh, it was interesting that with this nest that I was observing in Weybridge, the male would fly off and drag, take the crows with it, leaving the, take, uh, luring them away from the nest and leaving the nest more intact. In owls, like uh, raptors, the female is the bigger of the two. They, they re, what's called a reverse sexual dimorphism. The female's bigger than the male. Uh, and it's not entirely clear why. A lot of theories about what it may be, why maybe mate selection, maybe flying ability, um, maybe the need to sit on the nest so long and maintain warmth. The barred owl is the most common owl in Vermont. Uh, and it's a more animal of the woodlands. I said the great horn's more common in the Champlain Valley because we've got this mix of fields and forests. But as you move more into the inlands and into the, uh, away from Lake Champlain and into the mountains, the barred owl becomes much more common. And, and they'll be down in the Dead Creek area and down on the shores of the lake and some of the pine forests down there as well. Um, this, this is what most people in Vermont at least think of as our owl. And it's got a wide range of calls. That's its most common. Who cooks for you? <laughs> That's just the beginning of what you'll hear out of those guys. But they'll go back and forth. When you get more than one of them going back and forth, they'll go through a wide range of calls. Um, one of my most frightening experiences owling had to do with a bard. I probably gave away the punchline. The year before uh, this event, we, I'd been out of the Christmas count with Rodney Olson back, who's going to answer all my questions for me. And we stopped in this little hollow on a town line road between Addison and Bridport. And this is the year before any of the story I'm going to come to. It's one story leading to another. And it was, we we're having some trouble owling that night because there was a party in the house up on the hill. And the people at the party had seen us there, and they came down, and they weren't real friendly. The guy, the two guys coming down, and they said, I got a bat. It was their introduction to us. And Rodney says, I got a gun. <laughs> <laughs> Despite it, as dark as it was, I could see their shoulders go, just <laughs> drop. It's, really? No, we're just listening for owls. So, but the next year, I went back to that same place without Rodney and two other guys with me, instead with just my wife. And we're listening for owls and not hearing anything. And from up behind this house, I heard a scream, like a woman being murdered, just, ah! That was my first encounter with the uh, barred owl scream, which I've heard <laughs> since then. But that, I wasn't sure what I was hearing there. We just decided to leave fairly quickly. And, <laughs> Our total for the year might have been a bit low that time. So, yeah. The eastern screech owl is probably my favorite of the owls. It's the one I work the hardest to get in the Champlain Valley. I always wonder if I get more of them because I play their call so often or uh, because there are more of them. They do respond to calls, uh, and they respond fairly quickly. I get bored listening to barred owls because they'll wait for 10, 15 minutes before they answer back. Eastern screech owls jump in pretty quickly if they're around. And this is their call. So they describe that as the whinny and the bounce. And some books I've read say they do one at one time of the year, one at the other time of the year. In my experience, I've heard the same owl do both right after one another, just as in, that, uh, in this tape from um, National, Geograph or National Audubon.
And I've had success hearing uh, eastern screech owls in small woodlots with fields around them, uh, viney covered areas. If you get too much woodland around you, I don't know if they're not there or if the woods interfere with the sound, but I don't get as many of them. It's usually on the edges of the forest that they'll respond to the calls for me. Um, they don't need a lot of trees, but they are like, like the barred owl before them. These guys nest in cavities of trees. Uh, great horns will use old crow or red tail nests, but a lot of owls are, are cavity nesters. And so they need trees that are old enough and big enough to have those cavities in order to, to have a territory around. Screech owls come in two color phases, a gray and a, a red. Um, and these are just, they're, they're genetically determined, just kind of like a rough-legged hawk. If you're familiar with rough-legged hawks, they have a dark face and a light face. Um, the gray phase tends to be much more common in Vermont than the red phase, but I have seen red phase birds. Uh, there was a nesting, there was a, when I was down in DAR State Park during the Breeding Bird Atlas, and there was a pair of red phase owls uh, hanging out near the site that I was camping at. Um, there's not, folks don't really understand well the distribution of red phase and gray phase. The one theory I've heard, and I've also heard some count, counter to it, is that red phase birds are less tolerant of cold, which may be one of the reasons that we have uh, more gray phase up here, that they have a, a lower thermal tolerance, and so they tend to be uh, more of a southern version. Uh, there are some problems with that in that red phases aren't common along the Gulf Coast. The gray phases are more. But that's, that's the only possibility that makes sense that's been brought forth so far that I've seen. Our other little owl is the northern sawwet. This is more a bird of higher elevations. I think of it associated with conifer forests more than deciduous forests. Although the books, the, the guidebooks suggest that I should be looking them in, looking for them in deciduous forests more often. They, I, I haven't found them there, but they, they're supposed to be there. Um, and their voice, their call is said to be sound, sound like the sharpening of a saw or the wetting of a saw. When I've found these birds, it's mostly been on Snake Mountain uh, in the conifer forest, the, the juniper forest are along Snake Mountain. Rodney does banding of them on Snake Mountain. They are migratory. Uh, he, Rodney's caught birds here that were banded in Thunder Bay, Ontario, or Maryland. So they're moving all over the place. Um, also a cavity nester, uh, but will survive mostly on rodents. Uh, yeah, most of the owls we think of as being sedentary, but the saw wet, uh, the, it, well, the, the small, the, the screech owl we think of as being sedentary, the great horned is sedentary, barred owl probably more here year round, but the saw wets the, and the, some of the other ones that we're going into will move, range more. So those are the most common owls in Vermont. There are a couple species that breed here as well, but are much rarer, much rarer. Uh, of these, even the rare, this is the most common of the rare ones, the long-eared owl. Uh, a very thin version of a great horn, smaller. Long-eareds, um, I suspect, are more common out there than we give them credit for. They are very nocturnal, so they'll only be calling late at night when fewer people are around. Unlike the barred owl or the great horned owl, if you come across one of these in the woods, they don't fly away. They they, they narrow themselves up and freeze right up against the uh, tree, tree trunk, and so they're a lot harder to see. I've had the fortune of seeing a couple of them flying at night, but I also saw two of them uh, during the daytime. One was on a Christmas count in the uh, Mount Abe Christmas count, was in the cemetery in Bristol, uh, got out of the car, and it was being mobbed by chickadees. And uh, they, the compilers questioned me on that quite roundly because and rightly, because I didn't know how rare they were at the time, but I was able to see that this, uh, I described this facial disc here, the orange facial disc contrasting with the brown body is distinctive of either the long-eared or the great horned. And then the size just says that it was much smaller than a great horned would be. 
The long-haired ha long has a series of calls as well. The most well-known is its breeding call, which you'll hear mostly in the spring. And my, my tape's not that good. A single, loud, hollow, whoo, separated by five to eight seconds in between them. So they, 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 I've, I've heard them that same place where I heard the scream in Addison and uh, had the friends with the clubs show up. The, uh, there was a breeding long-eared in that vicinity during the breeding bird atlas. But they also have a series of calls most likely in distress or to warn off, um, warn off predators or something, or th that sort of thing, which is much more distinctive. <laughs> Describe that as a deranged poodle. <laughs> I've had good luck actually finding long eards um, at the Slang in Ferrisburg on Slang Road. Uh, they've, they've been spending a couple winters there. A couple different times I've had them there. Not this year, but if you get a long eared once every five years, that's pretty good. And I've had two of them at the Slang in the last seven or eight years. And also in, at various locations around Dead Creek and Snake Mountain, they, I've heard them. Uh, saw the one in the Bristol Cemetery, have seen a couple at night responding to calls, but my best sighting of a long-eared owl was in Maine. I was on a kayak trip and we stopped at an island and it was hunting the whole time we were on the island during the day. And the reason it was hunting is because it had an active nest, which we also found with three young in it. That was a real highlight. The short-eared owl is one of the prettier birds out there. Uh, this is a bird of four fields. It is quite unusual in the state. Has been documented as breeding here, but not frequently. Uh, very rarely, in, only in the Champlain Valley, pretty much. It's because it's, it likes the fields that we have around here. Um, more of a Midwestern or Western species. Very delicate, moth-like flight. They'll flutter around. Caught one in the headlights during one Christmas count and would just fly down the road in front of us bobbing and weaving back and forth. Also has quite unusual call. Uh, you'll have to listen close. That wink wink is the thing that you're most likely to hear and I've occasionally gotten out of the car and just heard that wink wink or had it respond. Um, the first year we did a Christmas count, my wife and I were at the end of the day, we're heading from where we were living in Weybridge to Jim's house in Shoreham? No, Br Bridport, just in the edge of Bridport. And we saw this bird drifting over the fields as we drove by and slammed on the brakes. I think I, my wife may have cut her head on the windshield. Uh, <laughs> hopped out of the car, perhaps it had stopped moving, and tried to get a look at it because I wasn't positive. It could have been a great horn. Started playing the tapes, nothing, nothing, nothing. Eventually had to go back came back later and played the tapes and got that wah, wah response. So he ended up with a short ear that night. But you no notice that unlike the other birds that live in the woods, this is a very soft call. Oops, sorry. That's next. It, it's a very, it, it's not, not as loud. And that's true of a lot of field birds. If you listen to larks or even harriers, they don't have, they've got these little tinkling sounds instead. But apparently those frequencies travel very well on the fields, and so they can get away with having a, a different range in their voice. The barn owl is, uh, is, I was very skeptical when Rodney told me that they were breeding in the, the area, but he's certainly documented convincing evidence that barn owls do breed in the Addison area, uh, and Addison, I think maybe Ferrisburg as well. I heard, I've never seen one. I did hear one for the first time this fall, Memorial Day in Virgins, just flying. I, I think it was flying over. I didn't see it, but I heard it twice on two occasions in flight. Um, but its screech is somewhat similar to that screech of the young great horns. That's the closest thing I can uh, compare it to. The barn owls have a pretty close to worldwide distribution, but they're 
decreasing in frequency in the United States, although they're maybe moving north now with climate change or, or what have you, they are, um, they are in a separate family from the other owls. There's, the, there's two families of owls, the Titanidae and the Strigidae, and their differences have to do with some of the bone structure in their ears. But these guys, there's been a lot of experiments done with their hearing. They've got tremendous hearing, um, ability to detect mice at great distance, and, and blinded owls can still hunt because their hearing is so good. Um, but yeah, these are, they're, they're quite nocturnal as well and nest predominantly, as their name suggests nowadays, in structures. There's some suggestion that in their native habitats prior to a lot of structures that they would nest in cliffs, but usually nests today are found in barns or other abandoned structures. And then, so that's it for the breeding birds in our area. But we do in the winter occasionally get some rare, very rare owls that will come here either due to population crashes of uh, rodents to the north or cold temperatures so that they have trouble hunting. So there is the possibility of finding, finding others. The boreal owl is essentially a slightly larger saw wet. Same habitat distribution, just a little bit further north and a little bit bigger, and the calls are similar, the songs are similar. There's just less spacing between the boops of a boreal owl than a, um, than a saw wet owl. Rodney, I'll bring up once again, has probably seen more boreal owls than anyone else in Vermont because of his banding station. And that's what, two, three, two. <laughs> yeah. they're, they're very unusual in the state. Uh, they would be difficult to pick out visually from a saw wet, I, I, I think. Um, and and they, they're not, they're secretive. They don't do fly out a lot, but they have been found. One of the most famous boreal owls about two, three years ago showed up on a Christmas count in New York City in Central Park. And a lot of people got to see that one. Northern hawk owl, I don't have a uh, tag for, but it is also a northern species, a very long tail. And notice a, f a very distinctive eyebrow pattern of this bird. Um, the biggest outbreak of northern hawk owls occurred before I was actively birding in the area, unfortunately, and in the territory that I now bird for the Middlebury count, but I've never seen one of these. They do show up every now and then. Uh, like, like some of the other northern species, they tend to be more active during the day, so when they show up, they're not necessarily hard to find, uh, but you've got to go to where they are because they're just not going to show up in great numbers anywhere. Great Gray, we were talking about here earlier, uh, put in an appearance in Burlington about two years ago, uh, stuck around for a day and then left. They often hang out, uh, they, they often show up in Montreal. There's some islands around Montreal that tend to attract a lot of birds. Uh, we keep waiting, one of these days we're gonna get a Great Gray showing up. It hasn't happened in a while, but they have a deep, booming call. Again, we'll tend to be uh, often out more in the daytime, especially if they're ranging uh, in our area, but certainly more a, a bird of the western mountainous area. And then everybody's favorite, the snowy owl, the Hedwig of Hogwarts fame. Uh, <laughs> I've heard more people claim to see snowy owls than are ever, surely than there are snowy owls in the area. <laughs> And a couple of things that, tell, that I'll ask when you, I hear someone say that they've got a snowy owl. First, did you get a look at the eyes? No, snowy owls have yellow eyes, as opposed to a barred owl, which has dark eyes. And a barred owl will, can be very light colored. And so you, it, it would be easy to think of a barred owl as a snowy. But if you get a look at that eye color, you're not going to make that mistake. The other is, where did you see it? Because snowy owls are birds of fields. They'll be out, they'll be hunting in fields, sort of like a um, short-eared, whereas the barred owls are more birds of the woods. And they're always going to be either in the woods or on the edge of the woods. Uh, snowy owl, you're not going to see deep into the woods at all. And snowy owl, again, like the hawk owl, is going to be more diurnal out during the daytime rather than active at night. I, when I first started birding back in college, I thought that I saw a snowy owl 
simply because I saw a large white bird at night. And I said, well, it's an owl. It's got to be. What else could it be? I still don't know what that was, but I'm no, no longer confident that it was a snowy owl. It might have been a gull out flying at night for all I know. But, so that concludes our tour of the owls of Vermont. And this time I'd be happy to take any questions. Yes. Barred owls make a lot of different calls. Uh, only a f I only played the ones I have on tape, uh, but they'll they, sometimes they'll, they'll make a, a screeching, a, like a, a click or something like that. It, it may be a contact type call where they're they're saying, "Is there another owl there?" It might be an alarm call where they want to express alarm but not really let you know where they are. Um, so I, I can't. S there's a, a lot of vocalizations for all these species that people just don't know what it means. Yeah. You sure. mice, mice, skunks, and then sometimes owls eat each other. Yeah. What is the other variety of types of prey that uh, they are? It's largely size dependent. Uh, the smaller owls, particularly the screech owl, will eat some insect matter, grasshoppers. Uh, they, some of them will specialize more on birds. Um, Sawwets have been known to take birds. Short ears will take larks and such. Their main prey is going to be rodents, uh, mice, and and the bigger owls will take on rabbits, particularly a great horn. A rabbit's getting pretty big for anything smaller than a great horn. Bard might be able to do it as well. Um, rabbit, skunks, cats. Uh, yeah. Somebody said fish. There are some species of owls that are particularly adapted to hunting fish. Not here, but Indian fishing owls. And some of our species have been known to take fish, but it's not a common part of their diet. Great horn. Great horn fish. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's been documented for great horns, for screech owls as well. How do you deliver a call? Do you, How do I deliver a call? Yeah, are you doing it verbally? Or do you no, I, I can try to do it verbally. I, I've successfully called in barred owl verbally. And I wasn't trying at the time, but I was it, late in the day, Christmas count, trying to get a red-breasted uh, nuthatch because I didn't have it on my list yet. So I just started squeaking to pull in a bird and had a barred owl fly up next to me, <laughs> which, which I'll take that instead. That's okay. Um, I, did, I also was able to whistle in a screech owl once, but knowing my whistle and knowing what they sound like, I think he might have had a hearing problem. <laughs> but mostly, uh, I used to play, use a tape player, and I use an MP3 player with an external speaker. Um, I, I, I've tried to lead people, instead of doing indoor stuff, take them out to hear owls, but if you get more than three people with you, it's going to be really hard to find anything. And I tr really try to minimize the amount of times that the play, it's not good for the owls necessarily. I only do it for Christmas counts when we're doing a survey of the birds or for the breeding bird survey. I, I don't do it just randomly. Question back? I, well, there, there might be different screaming for your life versions, but the, the, the one that I heard was definitely a bard because once you make that realization, you can start to pick out some of the tones that will then become a who cooks for you or some of the other pieces. But if you're not picking out those tones, I wouldn't be surprised if a long-eared could do something like that. But bard's the one I'm familiar with that does. Do the screech and then the who cooks for you? Sometimes. Sometimes not. Sometimes they'll just do the screech and leave you wondering. Can that ever be confused with a screeching coyote? I haven't heard a screeching coyote. Well, they can make, make some I, they can make some funny sounds, yeah. There's a lot of things when you go out at 2 o'clock in the morning that you never knew what they were. It's amazing how much a cow can sound like a long-eared owl, too. <laughs> We've heard farm equipment backing up, and I was sure it was a saw wet. <laughs> Megan? Sorry, no, no. That's a two-part question. The, 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 what they call ears for a great horn or horns aren't really ears. They're, they're tufts of feathers that stick up from the top of their head. 
and they can actually retract them or put them back up, but the long-eared ones are really long. But they aren't ears. Their ears are actually lower down in their head. Um, and that reminds me of a couple things I didn't say about their ears. Their ears are also asymmetrical. One ear will be higher than the other. And that allows them to distinguish the height of their prey. You know, how, it's just, just like we can see in 3D. A lot of animals can't see in 3D. We can because of the position of our eyes. The positioning of their ears helps them hear in 3D, essentially. And the hearing becomes so acute in some of the species, the boreal owl in particular, that their brain, their, their skull casing is different sizes. One size is large, side is larger than the other to hear the differences, to, to deal with the difference in the, um, the ear positioning. Their eyes, too, I, I mentioned briefly their eyes, but I got to bring, come back to the, their binocular vision. We can see about 180 degrees um, with good peripheral vision with uh, maybe 150 degrees of binocular vision where you can see in 3D. They, are, they have much more limited range of vision. They've only got about 70 degrees of um, binocular vision. And in order for them to see differences in distance and size, instead they move their head. And so a lot of times if you're at VINs or, watch, or something watching the owls, you'll, they'll, they will bob like this. And in order for them, because they're used to perching and looking down on prey, if you have an owl below you, in order for it to see, it has to turn its head upside down. Um, and one of the things that allows them to do that is they have 14 vertebrae in their neck. And so that allows them to turn their head almost 180 degrees in either direction. So between that bobbing and head turning, they are able to get a full range of binocular vision, but it's, uh, it takes some work. It's not just, it's not automatic. They can. I mean, they, they can adjust the positions of them. The tufts are there to direct sound. So if they're hiding, if they're trying to look inconspicuous, like if it's in your hand, it would drop it and try to be smaller. It, it, is, it is possible. They, they can change the position of their tufts. I would think if you've got a red-faced bird, it's probably a screech owl. And I think I know where you, you live, right? That, yeah, and, and you could have either one of them in that area, clearly. But I... Saw what? Yeah, if, if it's a more of a red phase, it's pro it's probably a screech owl. Screech owls and saw are about the same size. Even though I saw what I thought was a screech owl, it might have been twice the size. Yeah, uh, <laughs> fluffing up feathers can make you look really big or really small. Yeah, and and because of the the way they change their head positions, they will crouch down or stand up and. I've seen that with sparrows too. You just if they're cold and sleeping, they're tiny, and if they're it's warm and they're out walking around, they look big. It's possible. I, I mean, I, you got conflicting evidence: tufts versus no tufts. But red phase, I think it'd be screech owl. Usually, I would use the tufts to distinguish. So, they do have just a different jizz to them, just a general impression of size and shape. But I can't get that from a description as much. Yes, okay. So we used to have a cat that I, I sit here. Cat, here. No, I sit here. <laughs> because my husband saw an owl like the next day at the end of our driveway. But how do you encourage an owl to work on a property? How do you encourage an owl to work on a property? They're, they're going to need it. Um, yep. Yeah. Yeah. So there's not a lot of people that are going to be able to do that. If you're thinking of a bard, a sawwet, or a screech in a breeding season, they're going to need a cavity. They're going to need a box, to, and you can put up boxes to give them a cavity to nest in. Um, uh, because the other alternative would be a great horn, and there's not much you can do for them. They're, 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 going, to, they're going to use an old nest of a red tail or a crow instead of needing a nest box. If you give a nest box, 
of the right size and dimensions, and I don't have that information, but it's available online, they will sometimes use nest boxes. Uh, they can. Depends on how bad the winter is. And I think up in Lincoln, you might have a hard time getting a screech owl, but maybe a sawwet. Um, bards are going to be bigger, so they're going to need different dimensions. Uh, and, and have lots of mice and rats around. <laughs> That's often helpful. It's Whenever we heard one talking at night, we always heard the second one a distance away. It's quite possible. They do mate. Uh, I don't know if it's for life, but they do maintain a pair bond. And they'll also, there's, there's a different communications. They're going to have a communication between mates, which is a pair bonding exercise. They're going to have a communication between an adult and a young, which is very different. The young make very different calls. Um, and very similar. Okay, so that's more likely to adults. And you will have territory establishment. The easiest time to hear owls is in the fall, when the young are dispersing for the nests and trying to set up new territories, and, and there's a lot of birds out there. Um, so that's a, another possibility. So I guess the answer partially depends on what time of year you're talking. It seemed like it was year-round, wasn't it, Janet? Three months? No. No? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what do I know? But, yeah. but I would most likely guess in that situation that it's probably a mated <laughs> pair. Yeah. Uh, great horns are fairly, uh, fairly compact. They will stay in the same general area. They may or may not use the exact same nesting area. My Weybridge owl did not come back the next year, uh, but they will be in the same area. They are likely to be in the same area as long as they're alive and as long as they can defend the territory. More susceptible than. Yeah. Uh, well, s certainly from a driver's perspective, because they're out at night, they're harder to see. Um, I don't think I know that answer for sure, but it does make sense that because they're hunting by sound, the car is going to distract. Di dis it, it, or it may disrupt some of their ability to orient because of. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I've seen a lot of owl roadkill, but I've also seen hawk roadkill and other things, so I don't know if it's more than other birds. Yes? Can you talk a little bit about the difference in the call vocabulary in barn owl between a main pair and a territory in the No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know. I would say it's an area ripe for study. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I can say that I'm hearing owls, but I don't know necessarily what they're doing. Most of the ones I hear are responding to a call that I'm making, so that they're, they're responding to a territorial aggression or saying, what's going on? What are you doing in my area? But I, I don't, when I hear something, I'm not sure why they're calling what they're calling. Depends on the species. The most mortality is going to be in the first year. The young have a hard time establishing a new territory and uh, are, are likely to s starve. Um, beyond that, it can be five to 20 years, depending on species and how lucky they are. Um, this year, I, a lot of people may have been seeing a lot of barred owls around. We had a ton of barred owls in the Christmas count, probably tied to the really warm winter we had last year which meant high survivorship of mice, which meant high nesting success of owls. But now those first year owls are out trying to make a living, trying to do it on their own, and a lot of them won't be able to do it. So we'll see decreases from here on in likely. Yes? The scre no, the, the great horn, I, the great horn, I made the, the sound of the young, which was a screech. Yeah, a single screech. Yeah. Uh, would that be the only, we, we went a month or so in the summer with a similar call, but not didn't sound exactly like that, in the field, middle of night, yeah. two or three hours, that's pretty much the only hour. Well, yeah, that, I. 
the one time I heard that screech was the same owls that I'd been watching in Weybridge all, all the time, and it was a fall call. So I suspect it was a young bird. Parents weren't paying as much attention to it, and it was given that screech. Um, but you, barred owls make such a variety of sound, but there's different sets of tone to them that I would think if you're familiar with both, you could tell the difference. But if you're not familiar, I, I, I wouldn't hazard a guess. Yeah, I don't know where that rumor started. Um, I, I've, uh, everything that I've read about it suggests it's not true. That usually if you're talking about... At night, you know, yep. I hear that sound and I'm, so I'm probably not hearing a bear, I'm probably hearing an owl. Right? It's probably a barred owl. I've heard bear hooting. Everything I've read about it says bears don't hoot, barred owls do. And barred owls make a lot of different calls. So even if you know who cooks for you, you don't know the barred owl's repertoire. And so it's probably a barred owl. Yes. I hunt, and I've heard bears hoop. <laughs> it has a, a slight growl at the end. Okay. <laughs> you got a gun, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it hasn't been documented in the literature. Every, I've, I haven't experienced it. Everything I've read about it puts it in question. Well, I, I'm sorry, but do, do they have another sound they usually make that isn't a hoop? No, every time I ever heard them, they were just growling, and then they were growling. <laughs> Kind of and, and part of it could be the definition of what hoot is. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's different. Yeah. Can you, can you give us a few hints, like going out in the daytime to try and locate an owl, or see an owl? Cause, you know, yeah. I always look. I'm always walking woods, and I've never seen an owl during the day. So I, I'm always looking. I, the only time I've seen owls during the day is when I wasn't looking. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> and I've seen a bunch of them. They're out there. Um, the best clue is to follow the mobsters. Follow the chickadees or crows that are yelling and squawking at something. And you hear that, that all, in, you start to pay attention to their behavior because if they're yelling and talking to each other and moving along, that's not an owl. But if they're diving into the same tree over and over, whether it's a crow or a blue jay or a, um, a chickadee, take another look. There could be something that they're going after. A lot of times it'll be a hawk, but sometimes it'll be an owl. A friend of mine has a very good owl call, Peter Solomon, and he'll get all these birds all wrong. Yep, so yep. Like that's what they'll do, yeah. Amazing, yeah. Okay, but that, that's the yeah. only thing that has actively helped me find them. Everything else has just been, you're in the woods so and they show see, up. If you see a cavity in a tree, is there any signs around the cavity that might give you a clue that an owl is living there? If there are pellets around, I mean, they, the owls uh, don't, don't digest the bone and hair necessarily. They'll form it into a pellet and cough it up. A lot of other things will, and they'll usually do that in the vicinity of the nest or cavity. Um, those, yeah, so that's a possibility, but I find the nests or cavities are easier to find than the pellets. Because yeah. <laughs> they just blend into the duff at the rock. Burrowing owls. Burrowing owls, I, I, said, I described owls as being nocturnal predators. Burrowing owls are much more out during the daytime, but they're not around here. The only burrowing owls that I know, I'm sure I've seen, have been in Florida. They are on the Florida Peninsula. Other than that, they're more of a western species, western and plains species. There's one report of a burrowing owl from somewhere in New York State from, I think, the 1960s, but it was probably a released pet. Depends on the bird. Uh, bigger birds, larger territories. Um, a good woodlot plus fields for a great horn. Uh, yeah, or connected woodlots. We're talking, I, I guess I don't know. I, I, I want to say square miles, but I'm not sure that I'm right on that. I could find out. I've got a book over here that much of the information that I haven't gained from firsthand experience comes from uh, owls of North America, North American owls uh, it's from the 1980s, but it's still got a lot of really good information, good details in it. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. I will be happy to stick around and take more questions, but I'll let you escape some of the pent-up heat while we're at it and get back to your loved ones for Valentine's.